All right, welcome everybody to the stream today. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Adam Hartel. I'm a recruiter here at Noman, and it is my pleasure to host you today, as well as um, host our guests that we're gonna be talking with. Um, and I'd like to share with you just a little bit about uh, Bo Jansen, who is um, gonna be sharing with us today all about VFX, um, which is one of, the, one of the pillars that we teach here at Noman. Um, just a little information about Bo is that he has over 20 years experience in digital animation production. He served on a wide variety of projects ranging from feature films to television series to commercials in critical positions such as onset supervisor, concept designer, production pipeline designer, and project coordinator. Uh, Bo's credits include working as CG supervisor on Westworld, The Walking Dead, Stranger Things, and Gotham, as well as VFX artist on Man of Steel. Um, and Bo continues to bring his methodologies of communication, professionalism, and collaboration to his instructor, instruction right here at Noman. And as an education lead, he is responsible for developing curriculum for our VFX courses. Um, so we, we've got kind of the sort of this dual thing today. We get to hear from a veteran in VFX uh, talking about what, what is happening in that world, what, what he's done. We also get to hear from uh, one of our education leads right here at Noman. So with that, guys, um, I just want to welcome Bo to the stream. Bo, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks. Hey, All good right. morning, Adam. How's it going? Good morning. Yeah, good morning. it's going yeah. good. It's great to have you here. Yeah, um, good to be here. Yeah, so I, you know, just to sort of kick it off, if you could, um, if you could kind of like, I know that some of the folks tuning in might be a little bit new to VFX, mm -hmm. um, but also interested. And we probably have a lot of folks tuning in who who are already initiated, um, but are interested mm -hmm. in, in going a little bit more granular. But could you could kick it off by talking to us about, you know, what what is VFX essentially? Because I think a lot of people have different associations with what that can mean. Yeah, definitely. I could see how. Um... Uh, some parts of the CG pipeline might make sense. Like if you're a digital sculptor, you know, you're making objects in the computer, or if you are a, you know, a texture painter or a matte painter, you know, you're, you're making uh, images, but what is VFX? Um, I've got some student examples here. I can, uh, I can show you of um, uh, some of the work our students have done that we kind of classify as VFX. Here's um, uh, some work from one of our uh, graduates, Steve and uh, Hanau. Now, um, you look at this, it's kind of a classic uh, VFX shot, right? Um, you've got destruction, you've got all these kind of natural phenomenon being created, uh, the, the tower is crumbling into pieces, you've got smoke and fire and all this kind of stuff. Now, if you were to think how you would actually construct this, um, it's one thing to sculpt out the shape of the tower, but then all those pieces that it's breaking into, you couldn't manually, you wouldn't want to manually make all of those. Uh, much less animate them all falling down like that. It's just, it's too many pieces to have to work with. So uh, this is where uh, effects kicks in, where the effects artist is making up a procedure for how the uh, tower will disintegrate. And uh, they are bringing in what's called a solver, which is basically kind of a physics engine for how the gravity kicks in and how this thing kind of disintegrates and pulls apart. Then there's other kind of... Um, elements on top of this. You've got these little kind of small specks called particles that add a fine level of granular detail. You've got the uh, the smoke and the fire, which again, you, you can't really manually sculpt and animate this. So you're now mimicking the world of physics. You're dealing with how combustion works, how uh, smoke and dust work, all those kinds of things. Um, so this is um, a significant part of VFX, um, the kind of the, the simulation effects side of it. But there's other things as well that often kind of fall under the, um, the umbrella of, um, of VFX. I've got um, uh, another piece here by uh, another one of our students, uh, Miko. Miko Yustikio. He did this uh, piece. It's for an animation class. But uh, you can see there's a lot of stuff going on here. So um, there is some dynamic simulation. If you look at uh, on the horses, the reins of the horses are flopping around. And so you're not going to want to manually you know, take the reins and move those. So you're, again, setting up uh, principles of physics that behave on those straps. You've also got dirt kicking up under the horse's feet. So you've got, uh, again, there's some physics. But when you think about it, there's a lot more going on here 
than just um, sculpting horses and then animating them. Um, before you can animate something, you have to set up the controls for how you can animate it. Um, it's called uh, rigging. Now, rigging is kind of the equivalent of uh, um, imagine you had a just a, a wooden model of a, of a little puppet. You can't uh, move the puppet around and animate it until you define where uh, the, the joints are, where it can hinge, how it moves, set up the, the strings on it. Essentially, you're making a whole control system for the animator to then bring it to life and move it. So uh, rigging is one of those skills um, in setting things up to move that uh, we also kind of classify under VFX. Um, so other things as well, if you look at like uh, the trees in this, um, it's one thing to sculpt out a horse or sculpt out a soldier there, but think about those trees. You're not going to want to manually construct all those freaking trees. That's just kind of an insane amount of work. Um, so we get into the idea of procedural modeling, the idea that uh, you aren't modeling a tree, so you can do it once and then you're done, but you're talking about the process for how a tree is constructed. I know it's kind of esoteric sounding, but um, you make a, a procedural system for here's how a cylinder goes up and then it can branch off and branch again, and you throw some randomness into that and kind of scramble it up with different kinds of noises, and then you got a tree. So it's also in a more kind of complex construction like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Generate a forest. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, one one thing I should highlight really quickly here is you know both of these uh, sequences that you're showing us. You mentioned off the top. This is student work at Noman. Yes. And I love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at our reel and our student work and that can be very intimidating they might think oh well i have to i have to be at that level or close to that level in order to you know apply to the full-time program but um, I think what we're looking at here, both of them, I think, are best of term winners. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is an accumulation of the education at Nome. Yes, this is basically, um, don't feel you have to come in able to make this. Everyone starts out not knowing the software for the most part, or starts off, they, they can't walk into campus and make this. So it's a, there are a lot of classes um, that you know you, you go through to kind of build up this the broad skill set uh to be able to do something like this absolutely yeah sure sure um just as kind of an example of how someone gets into this industry uh i will say i was definitely a uh, a geek as a child um uh, if you need proof of that, here is me at age eight. Um, come here from the thing. So I, I like just to make things. I was always drawing and constructing stuff. Yeah, this is me at age eight. I was a full-blown Star Wars geek. This is my Halloween costume. And I, I liked, I remember I found that like a, a big cardboard barrel that summer. And I was like, I'm making freaking R2-D2 just because, um, I always like I, not just drawing and things, but I like to start to constructing stuff. I didn't realize how relevant that was going to be uh, for my career because that's what I really like as a VFX artist is this kind of creative construction and how am I going to take this weird thing and actually make it possible. Um, so uh, one of my first jobs in the VFX industry, I worked at a studio called Kleiser Walzak. And uh, there's me back in Kleiser Walzak in the day. Uh, you can see I'm, I'm there in these giant monitors that are so big you could like kill a horse with it. Um, and also um, you notice the statue in front there, Michael Jackson, he's wearing an old school uh, motion capture uh, setup. So that was back in the day when you had to have actual wires hooked up to your, uh, for a motion capture system. This is the mid nineties, yes. 
Um, so at this point, uh, Maya wasn't yet a thing. Um, whether I mean, so the software we we're using was all different back then. But uh, the same principles, the same ideas of, you know, the the effects work, the modeling, the sculpting, the the lighting, um, same ideas. But again, the, the tool set was all very different back then. Um, Yeah. Okay. Okay. That we can get that fixed if you can even hear me yeah. uh, sharing this right now. Hey, how about this? Well, sure. How about this? Uh, I'm, I'm going to do a, a quick shout out to a buddy of mine back there in that image, Tom Mitch Watson, who's sitting in the far. Um, he may be on the stream here today. He's actually. I uh, went on from uh, Kleiser Walzak here to work at uh, ILM and has been there doing just uh, amazing, mind-blowing stuff for, for years. So shout out to my buddy Talmadge if he's uh, watching on the stream here. Um, yeah, Kleiser Walzak was a really amazing place to work um, back in the day. Uh, I feel kind of fortunate that I started back here in the mid-90s doing this stuff because the tools were really kind of rugged. You didn't really have... Uh, the broad set of tools that we have uh, today. So it forced you to be a bit more creative in how you're going to accomplish your work. Um, I'll give an example of something we did uh, back then at Klaus Walzak. We were approached to work on um, the, uh, the movie X-Men. And uh, we were uh, given the task of um, working on uh, Mystique. So they wanted us to do all the, uh, the Mystique transformations for X-Men. Um, now, one of the reasons why they came to Kleiser Walzak is we, uh, they just finished up a, a movie, Stargate, which they had a whole bunch of these uh, morphing characters. Have everybody seen Stargate? Um, but that was a, a big, cool thing. Morphing was very hot back in the mid-90s. And uh, they figured, hey, you can make those characters morph in Stargate. How about you now make a character morph for uh, X-Men, for Mystique? Um, so I'll, I'll show some of the stuff we did here uh, uh, up on my screen here for, um, for Mystique. Now, um, uh, the thing about Mystique is it had a lot of, it wasn't the typical kind of 2D morph that had been done. So all the work that was done for Stargate, none of that really applied that much to, uh, to X-Men because um, it had to be a full-on 3D kind of morph. We had to move a, a, a full three-dimensional character. And not only was the character transitioning from one 3D sculpture to another, but it had uh, scales that had to react with it. So we had to figure out how do we affix scales onto the character, and then how do the scales then kind of flutter out as the character is, um, is, is transitioning. So um, it was pretty cool because, again, we didn't have a, uh, a, a very broad um, set of tools. For us. We had to kind of make up our own way of figuring this out. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty proud of the work we did then. I mean, by today's standards, it's technically using 25-year-old tools. But um, this is the kind of work I, I really enjoyed doing is um, myself and the other team of artists that worked on this, um, we used uh, – this was actually using uh, the Maya software. And um, we had to kind of cobble together – uh, all kinds of different tools, different ways of getting the job done for this. So I won't go into the technical weeds on it, but um, this is what I really like about VFX, is you're presented with this kind of crazy fever dream idea. We're going to have a woman who can morph and turn to people, and she's got scales to go and do all this. And then, okay, cool. Given all the tools at our disposal, all the things we can do and kind of um, – reappropriate tools for being used one way, use it for a different way, and and just kind of anything at our disposal. How do we construct a pipeline that can viably 
um, make this person uh, do these actions. Um, so it was pretty. Uh, it was a uh, it was a fun, rewarding uh, series of projects to work on. Um, Bo, I sorry to interrupt you. I don't know if yeah, your yeah. mates can hear me just yet, but I got to do a quick mic test uh, to make sure, sure the audio issue that we we're having uh, for my microphone has been solved. So we're going to uh, make sure here, uh, for those of you who might not be hearing, we're going to check. I think Adam's back on. He had some mic issues, but we're good to go. Yeah, I'm starting to see some thumbs up. So that's that's a good Sweet. thing. Okay. Um, I love that you started with what you did for Mystique um, because I remember, you know, being in, in the public and the general audience mm -hmm. for this when that film was coming out. And, you know, I remember the first time I saw that effect in the trailer. Um, yeah. and it was one of those moments like, okay, I'm, I'm seeing something totally new right now. It, it kind of looks like some stuff I've seen before, but I know that it's new. Um, and I love that you talked about, you know, the, the pitch that you got or the, 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 the brief that you got was like, well, just do some of that 2D morphing stuff yes. you've done before to solve this issue. Yeah. But you knew that that was going to be a much more complex. You're going to have to invent something new, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's the great thing is there's, especially now, there's so much CG you've already seen. Everybody comes to you like with these ideas. We want this thing we've never seen before, and so it's always that kind of constant challenge for making these kind of fresh visuals. And to do that, you really have to actively be able to drive the software in new ways. So it's it's not that oh, there's a button for this. Um, it's not that the software is driving you; you're driving the software, and yeah. you're able to kind of think about it and again, kind of piece together puzzle pieces that were maybe initially made to work this way, but you can kind of fit this into something new. Well, you're bringing up a really good point there, Bo, and I think that, that relates uh, on an essential level to what mm -hmm. Noman teaches and the way that we go about teaching. We're teaching people to be problem solvers. Can you talk a yeah. little bit about the difference between just learning software and really learning how to be someone who drives the software? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Our classes aren't software manuals. You're not signing up so, okay, great. Now I know all the buttons in the software that I can push. Um, now we're teaching you the software because you have to have something to work with, but more importantly, we're giving you, um, we're, we're building digital artists. And a digital artist is someone who can uh, work very openly with the software. It, it can kind of bend to their will. They can see how to make choices. There may be, uh, many ways of accomplishing a task um, that can seem kind of overwhelming. If I can do this one thing a, a dozen different ways, which do I choose? And so you learn how to critically figure out pipelines. Okay, I could do it this way, but then I'd be limited because I, it wouldn't be as easy to change. And that's part of the control you want as an artist is how much can you change this? How much can this adapt um, to art direction from a client or refinement from your own artistic vision? So you're, you're learning how to... Um, plan out ways of creating this kind of work that's uh, adaptable and changeable and, and modifiable. Um, and, you know, and use it in, in unexpected ways. And I, I want to dovetail with that explanation mm -hmm. you just gave um, to highlight a question that's come in from the chat, because this yeah. is a question that's been coming up a lot lately. Um, and this comes from uh, Twitch from, it uh, looks like Jock Sheesh. I hope I pronounced your screen name effectively. Um, so he's asking, or they are asking, um, I have a question, will Blender be industry standard in the close future? Um, and we're getting a lot of questions lately about, mm -hmm. oh, is it, should I, can I focus on Blender now? Can I invest myself in that software? Um, and I feel like you kind of indirectly answered the solution to some of those questions, but could you unpack that a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Blender is awesome. Uh, it can do a lot of cool things, but um, I would say, uh, if you're wanting to uh, get into uh, CG in, in general, Blender is awesome. It's free. It's very powerful. But in terms of the question, is Blender going to be more of a standard in the industry? Uh, I can say I've been doing this since the mid 90s, and I know better than to say this will be the standard 10, 15 years from now. You, you can't. I can't prognosticate trends that far ahead because it's so quickly changing. Um, but the one thing I do know that's going to be transcendent, what's going to be relevant 10, 15 years from now is these core principles of you know, your, your artistic eye, your ability to problem solve things technically. You know, all of those artistic skills, those aren't going anywhere. So even though maybe the software we did for Mystique is fundamentally different, 
um, the approach that we used is the exact same. Now, if you're using Blender or anything else, um, uh, well, here, here's something else talking about, should I learn Blender or not? It, it's great to know, um, you know, to get uh, maybe even something free like Blender that uh, you can get into and aggressively begin to work. It's gonna build up your general process of working in CG. Um, now we don't teach Blender at uh, Noman because right now it's not necessarily uh, the standard in the industry. Um, if you have an all Blender reel, that's maybe not gonna get you hired right now. So it's kind of that the, the pragmatic, what's gonna be getting, help you get a job. Um, now, but is Blender therefore not helpful because it's not the standard? I would say it absolutely is helpful. I would say anything you could use would be helpful. Um, uh, here's something else to consider. Uh, if you come in knowing Blender and feel kind of comfortable in that software, but then we take you into Maya and then later on into Houdini and something else, the act of learning another piece of software is gonna be important because um, it's helping you uh, kind of break your comfort bubble. You know how Blender works, but then if you're forced to use a different interface and different kind of process in Maya, similar but different, um, that's gonna be good because you're learning how to learn new software. You're used to breaking your comfort bubble. I've seen a lot of artists get very stagnant because they know this one thing. They're good button pushers for this one piece of software and they refuse to learn anything else. And then you just get stale and you're, and you're losing access to all these other tools at your disposal. So um, Blender's great. We don't teach Blender, but it's going to be good to learn one thing and then learn something else. You're learning how to learn. You're learning how to jump into a new interface and aggressively work through it economically, be able to um, become proficient in that other piece of software. Yeah. And to your point, Bo, um, you know, I've up until recently, I've more mm -hmm. been a 2D digital artist. I'm mm -hmm. doing you know, a lot of work in Photoshop and things like that. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, recently, you know, jumped on the Blender train and started learning about hard surface modeling, mm -hmm. uh, started learning uh, just a tad bit about rigging as far as it comes to posing characters, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, some of their digital sculpting package. And what I would say, you know, where Blender has been a huge help for me is it's a one-stop shop to get introduced to a lot of different things, including mm -hmm. some, some, you know, uh, visual effects and things like that. Uh, and it has 100% served me in also bridging into learning a software like ZBrush. So mm -hmm. I got exposed to digital sculpting in Blender and then went fully into ZBrush because I realized that I liked it and I wanted to take it further. And that doesn't mean that I've stopped using the first, I, I use both yeah. in that sense. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think that you're, I, I feel like what you're sharing is a really validating and empowering thing because it seems like you're saying the question is not which software do I choose? Um, it's more about how do I make myself a really good learner of tools? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. It, it's um, a, a dynamic industry and the way you keep up with it because I mean, I've been using Maya since its inception. I was a beta tester on the first version of Maya and it does not look like it did back when I started. So even though I'm in the same software, I'm still learning Maya as it as it grows and, and uh, expands. So again, you're you're always it's a moving target. You're always learning. And before we continue forward, I think I'll just tack on one more question from the yeah. stream for now. Um, while we're talking about software, uh, what are the what's the software we're teaching right now? Um, sure. At Nomen. Right now, we get you into uh, Maya. That's your primary 3D package that you get all your basic principles on. And um, uh, depending on the track you're in, um, if your emphasis is effects, we also get you heavily into Houdini. Now, Houdini, it's uh, another full 3D package that has, you, you can model, animate, sculpt, light, do everything in that, but it also is very, its structure is more adaptable. So you can do these kind of more complex things out of it. Um, the, the flow of data is much more uh, controllable so you can uh, kind of write your own tool set and make things. That's Houdini. Um, and, and, and again, you'll get into um, other packages like ZBrush for sculpting. You'll get into substance for texture painting. Uh, we get you into a bit of everything. Awesome. Well, not against everything because we aren't teaching everything, but <laughs> you, you, you do get, um, um, and we'll throw in other uh, plugins to kind of augment Maya. Like we'll get into fracture effects in Krakatoa and um, you know, other little things uh, we'll bring in. Um, and, and just to kind of go, go back to talking about learning software, um, for instance, I started teaching in one of my classes, uh, the Bifrost graph in Maya. Um, 
Now, it's a, a really cool functionality within Maya. It's very powerful. But the reason I teach it is not that Bifrost right now is standard in history and amazing, but it's a great vehicle for getting into these concepts. So like I say, we're not a software manual school where you come in knowing how to push buttons, but we're teaching you processes and how to think and, and, and work as a digital artist. And so it is always adapting and changing. I've been doing it less than a year now teaching Bifrost because um, it's a, a great way of aggressively getting students into these more higher end concepts. Yeah. And it's not to say that we don't get granular into teaching the software. We just don't stop. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you, you, whatever software you learn at Noman, you're going to be a ninja in that yeah, software. Yeah. But um, you're going to come out of that process also with the ability to empower yourself to become a ninja in other software that you'll be mm -hmm. learning in the future. Yeah. Um, so, Bo, thanks thanks for the aside on that. But, but yeah, please continue with uh, some of the stuff that you want to show us. Yeah, sure. From your story and projects. Yeah. How about this? Uh, I'll show some work I did more recently here um, at a studio. Um, I was at a studio for a while called COSA. I was a CG supervisor there. And um, just to kind of talk about software, what we're saying here, one of the things that COSA said is uh, that they're software agnostic, <laughs> that uh, they use a lot of Maya, they use Houdini, but the philosophy was whatever it takes to make the shot, we'll use it. So that's kind of a good tie back to what we're saying. It's not just a Nomen thing. This is a, a um, industry thing. Um, COSA, we did a lot of uh, television work, which I really enjoy because it gets you thinking uh, on a quicker turnaround, you have to work at a pretty fast pace in television. And there were some pretty cool projects I worked on there. We worked on uh, Westworld and Gotham and um, uh, Walking Dead and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. There's a really talented artist there. And there was one project that I thought I would uh, kind of flag up because I ended up doing uh, a lot of work um, uh, making slugs. <laughs> I made a lot of like slugs and squishy things. We got to work on Stranger Things. And so I thought I'd kind of pull out, uh, um, working with, a, with slugs uh, or kind of leechy kind of things, it's not a standard kind of creature. We did do this uh, the Demogorgon, but um, it's kind of a cool challenge because you get a lot of, it's a different kind of thing to have to animate. So here's um, a sequence with, uh, uh, at the end there, a little, uh, oh yeah. Yeah, a leech that gets spat out in the sink and goes down. Now, um, if you look at that, uh, I show the layers here, the original uh, plate that was shot of the, the drain. You see the actual little slug itself, as well as a layer of the slime. So this did have a component of dynamics in it. So you have the splattery slime that it kind of crawls through. Um, in the final shot, that's very subtle. You don't really look at it and go, oh, look at the slime. But it's one of those little things there that really helps kind of marry it in and it feels gooky and nasty. Um, so there's a lot of these little small things that kind of uh, build up uh, to make this uh, work. Now, um, the actual uh, creature, uh, we worked on rigging this up. I believe the rig was done by an artist there, uh, Sebastiano Depril, who um, uh, really great work. I've worked with him on a lot of things. He's very talented. Um, but again, this isn't a standard kind of thing. It isn't like you're working on a... Um, you know, a, a human with arms and legs. It's now a squishy right. thing that has to slime. And it, it has to look like it's got its own kind of will of movement, but it's also just a big wad of mucus. Um, yeah. So that was a, a, a cool project. And um, that's one thing kind of interesting is once you do one project, uh, a lot of that development is going to uh, apply to other things. I worked on another uh, show later on called The Mist, where we had to uh, cover a uh, an actor in a bunch of leeches, so it was a little bit uh, a little bit different. Um, but again, a lot of the same idea of how do you set up a character. Now I'm I'm showing here also uh, the rig. This was also made by uh, my buddy Sebastiano. Um, so you're working with um, conserving the volumes as it moves and stretches. It doesn't kind of lose mass but it kind of elongates. We also had special things that to kind of make the surface look kind of smoother and more uh, bunched up as it went. But uh, the shot called for covering a guy in literally thousands of leeches. <laughs> uh, and so again, it's one of those things they come to you and say, hey, we have this uh, idea for a script where a dude did this. He's covered in leeches. We have to figure out how to actually make that work. 
So there's yeah. a lot of technical uh, things to work with. A part of it was not just in Stranger Things, we had a slug. Now we have to do that times a thousand. So yeah. um, we, we propagated out a, a library of these. So a lot of this was, um, we could do have one-off control, but we had to make this so it would work in a, in, um, in a sense that you have just so many of these, you couldn't move them all yourself manually. Almost like um, all the pieces in the tower that collapsed. You have to get, get a process now for moving all those around because it's too much for one artist to do um, manually step by step. So again, you made a library of these, went through a process for how to affix them on the character, on the actor. Um, so, um, and we had a lot of shots of this. Uh, so here's uh, the, the, the gentleman being uh, covered in leeches bit by bit. <laughs> We actually had, uh, he had a surgical wound. We got to crawl leeches into his surgical wound, which is always nice. Um, it's fun to come home at the end of the day and say, what did you do, honey? Oh, I covered a dude in leech, it covered a guy in leeches. And then we had him crawl inside of his uh, abdominal wound. It was really great. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I, again, so there's so many other technical things involved here, not just moving the leeches, but one of the big challenges was getting them to move with him because he's there twitching and moving all around. There's a lot of motion. He had to work with his performance. I mean, he, had, he can't just kind of sit there static. He has to be twitching and undulating around. So a lot of work went into how do we affix all these leeches onto this moving character. Now, um, this was a great um, uh, group effort to make this happen. Um, we had to rely very heavily on compositing. Now, compositing is the uh, uh, once you generate the, the 3D imagery, it's like when you saw the, uh, the pass of the little um, Stranger Things uh, slug, the pass of the slime, the background image, other images involved, but the compositing artist is the one who then brings it all together. And they're the one who um, layers together all these pieces of imagery into one thing that looks cohesive like they are really there. This this illusion is really happening. So in, in this, for instance, uh, there is no mist in the air. All of that atmosphere is um, composited in. So all the leeches, how we we're able to um, get those on. And that was a great group effort. Um, I was CG supervisor, so I was in charge of the 3D pipeline of this. I worked with uh, the 2D supervisor, Kama Mohia. Uh, he was awesome to work with. And we had a really great comp artist, Bill Church, who really helped us um, figure out the pipeline for how we could really lock these leeches on the character. Um, so um, I'm bringing that up primarily as um, there are a lot of different uh, disciplines that go into making this, different specialties. And uh, it's important to know, uh, have a, an appreciation of all the links in the pipeline, how everything works. Now, you may not be the specialist in this. I mean, Bill Church was the comp artist who did a lot of the R&D to figure this out. Um, I, I don't possess Bill Church's skills, but I knew enough that I could work with him. We could kind of collaborate. How can I help you? How can you get this done? So it's a real choreographed synergy of how all these things work together. And so that's one of the things that we emphasize, even if you're going in the VFX track, and maybe you are into dynamic effects. That's your passion. You're really great at that. Well, you still have to know what a, the concerns are of a modeling artist or of a rigging artist or of a texture painter. So um, at Nomen, we do give you, um, it's called a generalist background. You know a bit of everything. You're not just learning your one little niche and becoming smart in this very myopic small view. You know a bit of everything because it's critical that you communicate with other artists in the pipeline. That's gonna be important. Uh, the reason that this was able to work is um, all of the artists are able to kind of work with each other very effectively. Um, you know, so that's one of the things that, uh, from our expertise and our experience in being able to pull out shots like this and knowing the synergy that it takes, that shaped our curriculum and we, um, we make sure you have that common generalist knowledge, even if you are specializing in something. Yeah, and that's that's so important too, uh, because a, a lot of times the question out there is like, you know, as an artist, do I do I go general or do I do, do I go specific? Um, and mm -hmm. it I really I feel like you know what what Noman is teaching is actually it's a both and, like you yeah. you can yeah. you can be really strong in one area, but if you do that at the expense 
of not knowing how to work with the rest of the team. Yes. Uh, you won't be as effective of a problem solver. And, Definitely. you know, potentially, I mean, you're always going to be more valuable to the studio when everybody around you feels like you're lifting the environment in the way that you yeah. contribute. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another really cool thing that uh, you're, you're bringing up, especially in, in showing the slugs, because I think a lot of times for the uninitiated, when we think VFX, we're looking for the really big money shots, right? We're looking mm -hmm. for the big deal. And definitely that's in, VFX is involved there. But mm -hmm. since it's come so far in what we can produce in terms mm -hmm. of realism, a lot of times uh, it's you know, you, there's VFX art artists working on things that we don't even stop to notice well, our VFX. Yeah. And I think that that's so important because um, the nature of that, I wanted to ask a question. You'd mentioned mm -hmm. uh, the mist in that scene was, you know, not on set. Mm -hmm. And, you know, also that could, it could very well have been done practically, right? Like putting oh, yes, on definitely. the actual set and the filming. Um, what was the importance of that decision to say, we're going to film without that as a practical effect. Mm -hmm. And we want to bring that in later. Yeah, um, that's one of the things that's really amazing about this tool set uh, for filmmakers and storytellers here is the amount of control that you have. Um, if you were on set with a fog machine, um, you could spit out fog and make all this happen. But what you want is like this uh, sequence had to kind of ramp up and the fog starts thinner and it gets thicker and thicker and thicker. So, you know, and you want to be able to kind of obscure the leeches enough. They're kind of there, but creepy. Um, and you wouldn't have that kind of control, like the, the shot where um, his brother is shooting him at the end. That should be just murky if you can tell what's going on, but almost not there. You couldn't have that kind of control if you tried to do this on set. So, um, yeah, there's a huge amount of effects out there that people maybe don't realize are effects. Um, uh, for instance, um, thinking about, you know, snow, here's maybe a good example things you may have thought would be effects. Um, there's no reason to go to uh, a cold environment and produce snow on set or hope it's snowing nicely on the day of the shoot. Uh, that's not going to be practical. Um, so I, I've made so much snow in shots. Um, you know, Game of Thrones, and um, I made some for Walter Mitty, that, that movie had some beautiful exterior shots, had a little bit of snow, but they wanted to make it really perfect art directed, where how the snow's going, so we added in snow. Um, yeah, because the, the idea is you have this level of control now, and why not use it? Let's make the snow perfect if we can. Um, so uh, artistic direction is one of those factors. Others are just uh, expense. I mean, why would you go through the expense if it's going to cost more to do it this way when you could add visual effects to it? For instance, uh, set extensions. There's no reason to take over a huge amount of real estate and build sets for everything when you can do it just kind of small green screen and digitally put out the rest. Now, yeah, you could have actually built that set and we would have, you know, 20 years ago maybe, but why bother? Um, we can do it cheaper. Also think um, control and safety. Right. I mean, we can do things now with stunt people, you know, or maybe even the stunt person couldn't really do it. You have to do a digital double. Mm -hmm. right? there, we, don't have to, we don't have to fly a stunt person through a window uh, on strings. We can do a, have a digital character do that. So um, beyond just spectacle that we can make, uh, it's giving filmmakers a level of control. It's giving them a level of, um, you know, it, uh, it's safety and expense and everything. It's, it's making the, uh, the movie making process more streamlined um, where, I mean, you wouldn't think that, you know, romantic comedies, <laughs> you know, why would you have VFX in romantic comedy? <laughs> well, yeah. everything has VFX in it now. Um, because again, as a filmmaker, you want that kind of control to make everything just so. Which I would guess that, you know, that just means that there's that many more jobs now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you, I, I mean, I'm I'm definitely uninitiated when it comes to being you know I'm not a I'm not a, a VFX artist myself but it seems to me that sort of the life cycle of this in entertainment was there was a time that when you were doing a set extension it was a little obvious you know you could tell that they decided to to do it that way instead of practically but nowadays it it seems like things have come so far along that the the viewer really can't be sure anymore yeah I, I can't be sure. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, yeah, there, there are effect shots that I'll fully admit I have no idea those are fake. Um, I, I think sometimes when people look at effect shots and say, oh, that's fake, um, I'm very slow to criticize uh, bad vi- visual effects and say, oh, that looks fake. Because um, honestly, some of the times it's the idea you're trying to do in the first place. You're trying to make, you know, um, a small child lift up a truck. And it's like, that looks fake. Well, yeah, because you know that child's not lifting up the truck. And it's kind of hard to suspend reality. It doesn't matter how good it looks. You know that didn't really happen. So your brain kind of tells you it's fake. But, um, you know, again, set extensions. I, if you gave me a button and said, watch this movie, hit that button when you think you see a visual effects shot, I'm sure I would miss many of them, even with my critical eyes on this. That's yeah. just kind of how nice it is now. Yeah, and I think we we also need to remember that you know, sometimes when something's being done for the first time, it's because it's the first time. So you yeah. go, you go back to the nineties when, you know, people were a little more like, Oh, I can tell that that's CG, you know, that's, that's not really there. Um, or they used so much CG in that production. Well, we mm-hmm. need to remember that some of that was pioneering. Oh yeah. Like we yeah. needed, we needed that period of time to get to where we are today. Um, yeah. because it is constantly evolving. Yeah. Um, Cool. Um, yeah, but yeah, please, please continue because I know sure. you have really cool stuff. Uh, still, I'll, I'll show you another uh, project here. Also worked on at uh, COSA. Um, uh, wings. I've done a lot of wings. Worked on the show Lucifer uh, for a while, and uh, I made wings for other um, projects. But this had uh, a, a lot of unique um, challenges to it. Uh, now, when you're making wings, this is an uh, encompassing a lot of different disciplines. I have to, you have to work with uh, feathers that are working in conjunction with the movement of the wings. So it's now not just, you know, an, an, an arm or a, you know, a, a leg moving, but we now have a limb that has all these interplayed uh, feathers that have to work together. Now all those feathers have to look unique. They have to be able to be kind of splay nicely. They have to have their own very complex surface pattern. Um, you figure feathers have to look soft. They're kind of translucent. They have these ridges to them. They kind of um, quill down the center. Um, you know, it has to look kind of you know random and bunched, but not too irregular. Um, so there's a lot of R and D, a lot of development you know, that's uh, brought in. Even things like uh, we had to work in um, kind of fuzz and hair into this to kind of give a nice sort of downy uh, level on top of it. Um, now for the show, we had a, a whole bunch of. Uh, wings that we created uh, for different characters. And as we went, they, uh, I really appreciated this, that um, they weren't too sure about the wings and they wanted to use the wings because they knew it was going to be kind of expensive and complicated. But the more wings they did, they realized, wow, this is, this is great. We can now tell parts of the story that we couldn't otherwise. We didn't think we could tell have more characters getting wings and do more with them. So they kind of kept giving us more and more. You can see a turntable there um, of uh, a set of bloody wings. So you can see there's like some uh, wings that were shot up. So um, they kept throwing more and more at us, which we had to kind of develop and build on our basic setup. Um, So again, we have rigging. We have the idea of uh, the surface properties of the wings. Um, Now, one of the things also about this is the things the wings had to do were not things that actual birds could accomplish. They had to kind of move in um, pretty crazy ways and do things that the anatomy of a wing couldn't accomplish. So um, again, how do you kind of get this and make it plausible? Mm-hmm. So the these sort of supernatural wing things actually, um, you know, worked. Um, and uh, it was a, a, a Definitely a challenge, but I think we had some uh, some pretty cool shots. Again, numerous characters, and as they went on in the show, they had had them doing more and more and more until at the very end, there was a season finale where Lucifer literally is doing a like a John Woo style fight sequence and burst through windows and start he's kicking butt with his wings, and they're all shot up and bloody, which is a whole other set of development. How do you then take these feathers and now put blood splotches and on them and chew it all up. Um, uh, and again, you can see, um, I've seen the breakdown running other things that go in to augment this. Um, there are, um, in, in the one finale, there you go through the window. You can see we do set extensions because, um, 
there's no outside when he breaks through the window. In fact, when he goes through, it isn't even him. We had to make a digital version of Lucifer. Mm. And of course, that character, we also had to have digital clothing that flopped around. He had a digital hair that was groomed. Um, as he busts through the window, you have to have all the bits of glass and wood and, and the dust and crap in the air um, that had to work. So again, you're, you're tying together a lot of different uh, skills have to kind of blend together seamlessly into one final uh, result. Yeah. And I, and I think that's so important. I mean, it, one thing is design, right? Pre-production. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of yeah. problem solving that happens design, but it, it seems to me that what you're saying is, you know, when it comes to VFX, you're doing a, sometimes an insurmountable number of problems that need to be solved, but you need to solve them in a way that they are hundred percent ready to be the final product that yeah. people are seeing. Yeah. 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 You know, so it's, again, again, this comes back to, there are dozens of ways you can make this, but what way is going to give you the most control? What way is going to work as you're beating this through a pipeline, doing dozens of shots, this way is going to hold up. It's going to be controllable. It's going to not just give you the beautiful end result, but be something that when you come out on the other end, you're still, you come out on time, on budget, you met your deadline and you kept your sanity in the process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah, looking back at this, it, it was a huge amount of work, um, but uh, th there's something rewarding in knowing that you've got, you know, all these things kind of orchestrated. Oh, again, a lot of hidden things as well. Maybe you didn't, you wouldn't really appreciate. You can see when he's going down the stairs there, uh, the stairs are, are shiny. So you're seeing his reflection in the stairs. Um, as he goes through the, uh, the dust there at the end, he is, his wings are wisping the dust, interacting with it. So he is moving around that dust that didn't exist in the air. So um, th there's something fulfilling about getting into these shots and having all these skills to bear and all these artists we can throw at this. Because again, this wasn't, um, I want to make sure this what doesn't seem like I made these. This was a team of artists <laughs> by all means we had. And in fact, one of the artists who helped develop um, the, the technique for working on the, um, the bloody wings, Ying Lei Yang, She's one of our instructors at Noman. So uh, there's a number of instructors that we have at school that I work with professionally. Um, there's another one, David Strapinis. He helped out with some of the, uh, the lighting on this. Um, and he's also an instructor. So um, one thing that's kind of cool is to work with these artists in production, in the trenches, making this stuff. And then at Noman, we're still working together um, in our sort of whole education curriculum, working, uh, leveraging off each other's work. That's really cool. Yeah, and when you're and you're also bringing up something I think that makes Noman uh, unique, and that is that all of our instructors are required to be um, industry artists. In oh, absolutely, yeah. To teach at our school, so you're when you when you're in class, you're literally getting instruction from uh, not just a sort of general process. You're getting instruction that is on the level of what that artist used in studio that day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you're, you're staying totally current. Um, so that's, that's one thing that's also kind of cool. Part of my responsibility mm -hmm. uh, at Noman is, is uh, bringing in faculty, uh, staffing up people. And it's always pretty cool when I, I contact some of me I've worked with and say, hey, we have a class and such and such. Would you be interested in teaching? And um, it's it's kind of cool because, oh, wow, I'll teach at Noman. Wow. It's, it's like you do amazing stuff every day. And you're kind of now like feeling flattered that I'm asking you to teach at, at, at Noman. But uh and they take it very serious. Like, wow, you know, okay, I'm going to bring my A game because this is, this is a serious school. Okay. So what do I, I, I remember talking with uh, Ingle when she uh, came on, she's like, I'm going to teach at Noman uh, because someone else, I, I wasn't the one who hired her. Uh, someone else did, but she was kind of like, all right, so what's this going to be? How's it going to, you know, taking it very seriously uh, because it's, it's not just kind of like, eh, I'll come in for a couple hours and show them, push some buttons. Um, these are, the, the, the teachers we have, this is their discipline. This is their, their passion. They're artists. And we all take it very seriously that we are helping the next generation of artists uh, learn their voice and, and do this work. We take it very seriously. This isn't just kind of like, you know, a throwaway stuff. This is something that all of our personal passions go into this. Yeah. When you're, and you're bringing up a really good point. And I think that it, it ties in with what you're saying earlier about we're not just teaching software. Yeah. If it were just about learning a software, well, you, you can take tutorials to learn that. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes, at least I feel, 
that, you know, the line that sort of gets blurred because we're talking about an art form that is digital, mm -hmm. um, that can be technical. Um, it sort of sometimes gets siloed off to this thing of like, well, it's, it's pseudo art. Um, yeah. But I think when you, when you really break it down with what you're saying, the teaching is so much about the transmission of that artist, that person mm -hmm. and what they do yeah. to the person that they're mentoring. Um, it, it's really not any different than say in the Renaissance when you had to have this lineage of yeah. you know, Michelangelo apprenticed, you know, th this was their apprentice and then they taught so, so and so. And yeah. you can actually track that nowadays. Um, so, yeah. Oh, yeah, this person obviously learned from that person mm -hmm. um, and what they do. And yeah. uh, it's, it also sounds like, if I can reflect on something you were saying earlier, it sounds like, you know, when you were talking about the reasoning for using, uh, you know, digital as opposed to practical, mm -hmm. um, is that element of art direction, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, we know it's just fog and we could put some machines on stage to do that. But when you're doing VFX, it sounds like in a lot of ways, you're really getting to art direct reality. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 And that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause you can, if, if, all right, again, I'll, I'll, I'm going to sound poetic, but kind of to springboard off what you're saying about the Renaissance kind of thing, you, you look at these artists, you know, you, you pick up any big art history textbook, like Gardner's Art Through the Ages, your typical standard art history textbook, and you go through it and you have these amazing artists that could do such amazing revolutionary work. And um, then you look at what, we as digital artists now have our medium that we have, and you think the level of control, you know, if you're working as a sculptor, you are limited to what you can physically make out of marble and clay and bronze and whatever, but now we don't have a limitation. We can defy physics. And, you know, what painters could do with a brush on canvas, well, now we can take an extra dimension to that and we can make things that are defying reality uh you can't tell if it's real or not or you, you can go stylized you can go hyper real but the the opportunity that you have from this medium is pretty um awe-inspiring you know and yeah. i think also as an industry this is pretty young i mean i've been doing this for forever and it's just since 95 so you're looking at something that's not even half a century old yeah and think where this can go what will this be in the future you know what well, this, and it, it is an art form. Just because you're working with software and ones and zeros doesn't make it any less of an art form. And to think well, where that can be in the future. Totally. You're bringing up something really important. And it, it is a question that I, I do hear a lot. Um, and you're, you're pointing towards the answer to this question. What you're saying <laughs> is, you know, you know, if I'm going to be a VFX artist, mm -hmm. you know, uh, is it really, how important is for me to understand things like art fundamentals? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's the part about it. I really, the, the part, one of the aspects I really enjoy is it's artistic and creative, but you've also got this, um, these uh, technical tools you're using to make your work. Um, so it's this great interplay of art with math and science. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that that may, may be kind of, um, uh, for some people want to get be, be a professional artist saying, Oh, I got to get into math. Um, yes, but it's not math. Like you think it is. Uh, I teach, uh, actually also one of the math classes at Noman and that's, I really, really wanted to do that class. Cause it was so important to me that people, um, like myself who didn't who took math in high school and throughout my K through 12, it was okay. Didn't really understand it that much. Didn't see it as being relevant. Um, it was so important for me to, to show the relevance of this kind of uh, mathematical thinking and how uh, powerful it is, how beautiful it is. There is an aesthetic. Um, when you're looking at this work, you're looking at the result of, you know, a, a computer processing, processing a bunch of numbers. And so to be able to work with that, to have this level of control, um, getting into that kind of technical world to some extent, um, gives you more power and more control. Now, that's not saying that you're going to be a mathematician sitting down doing freaking long division all day. It's, it's not about that. Um, the, the kind of math we do is is not the kind of math that the average student in high school would expect. Um, we're using it as a way of controlling things. And as an artist, that's the, that's the thing you really need the most of is control. So I um, want to emphasize, you know, uh, if you want to get into this kind of industry, um, uh, pay attention in your math classes. 
<laughs> uh, and your science classes. Um, uh, I understand that the way math and science are taught not to disparage K through 12, it's not necessarily the way that we use it, but we definitely use it. Yeah. Would you say that the other side of that coin is also true? In other words, the, the statement of, you know, in order to art direct reality digitally, you do need to understand art fundamentals. Um, yeah. But it doesn't mean that you have to be the best painter. You know, it doesn't mean you yeah. have to be, you know, at the top of your class in that in that regard. Yeah, I, I realized I answered your question in a different direction. You're asking about the art stuff. Well, no, you're, you're answering a really important part yeah. of the question um, because it, it's, it's holistic, right? It's both sides. It's yeah, it, it, it definitely is. So yeah. you, you can't ignore your uh, your analog skills, uh, your, your drawing and your sculpting. Those things definitely work off each other. I mean, I always enjoyed working in clay. I always enjoyed sculpting. And I found that the more I worked digitally, that made me better in the clay, that it worked off each other that the more I worked making imagery uh, out of 3D renders, that made me a better um, artist with you know, pencil and pen. Um, but that's not to say that there's kind of a home for everyone in this. So if you're more the kind of person who enjoys the technical weeds of this and wants to kind of get more into the kind of programming side and more of an extreme, there's a home for you. If you're the one who I like to sculpt and paint. I like to really the kind of the hands-on, getting my hands into the art side of it. I don't really want to go more technical. There's a home for you there as well. Um, yeah. uh, and everywhere in between. Well, and what about the person out there now who's, and it's not hypothetical, I just saw a question come in through okay. the Twitch stream. Uh, what about the person out there who has heard what you said about math and is going, oh no, like math is my weakest subject. Yes, I, I get that. And again, yeah. that's why I want to teach a math class that um, I totally appreciate that, you know, you come to know, well, the students I have in my math class, you're coming to art school, cool, I'm gonna be an artist, and you're teaching me math, what? It seems very unintuitive. And it seems like this is just a hoop you have to jump through because of accreditation. But um, the only, ultimately the answer is the class I would give, that would, that would kind of be the, um, you, you, I don't expect you to take what I'm saying on just sheer faith, but uh, the real proof is take my class. But the one thing I would say is just know that we're not doing a bunch of long, boring algebra. We're not doing boring graphs of trig functions. It's not about that. Um, when I think about math, I think about patterns, right? The thing about math is it's predictable. You know, if you put a number to an equation, it's going to come out the same every time. And so how do you take this kind of predictability, the patterns, and use that to begin to control things, right? When I'm putting a thousand leeches on a person, I can't do that by moving each leech itself. So I have to look for patterns. When you're uh, breaking things apart, and like uh, Steve and Al's uh, tower falling, um, you, you can't, he couldn't move all those manually. So he's looking for patterns. He's looking for structure, for predictability. And the cool thing about that is um, this kind of predictability and patterns, uh, that gives you a really powerful tool. It gives you the means of controlling a lot of stuff. Um, very simple things. Now, you, you'd be surprised how much control you have with very basic math. D don't think that oh, I'm looking at complicated things, this must be high-end calculus. No, even very basic patterns and structures, basic multiplication and addition, this, that kind of simple grade school kind of stuff. Um, you can use that and make a lot of cool things. It, it, it's, the, it's the creativity behind it. I don't see math as a um, something for accountants and engineers only, right? This is my... This is a tool I have for kind of tapping in and really making my, you know, when they come to you for something you've never seen before, to get the something you've never seen before, you need control. You need to be able to move things in different ways. And the the, the numbers help me do that. Yeah. Well, that certainly makes the numbers more exciting too. Like oh, yeah. Like yeah. I mean, math for math's sake is yeah. can be really boring. It, it is. Some, and as much as I but, enjoy math, yeah. I... Okay, I have to do my taxes this year. Oh God, taxes yeah, yeah. again! I have to do. It. I, I don't find any. I don't find sitting around and doing random. I, I you know, I have spent quarantine like 
all right, I'm going to do some mad, mad multiplication. Yo, this is going to be great. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's an artistic tool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. And that's, that's the difference, right? Like there's things that I have once found incredibly boring that now it's exciting when it becomes a tool that helps me make something I'm excited about. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and while we're on the subject and guys in the chat, we're going to be getting, we're going to be, you know, just a little bit digging into a lot of these questions that have been coming up. So, so hang tight. Thanks for your patience. Um, but as long as we're on the subject, uh, what advice would you have right now for, and I'm, and I, you know, when I pose this question to people, I'm, I'm, I, I want to ask you to imagine kind of, uh, two different ranges. One range is mm -hmm. someone who, is seeing the kind of stuff that you're showing today and is, and is looking at VFX going, this is so cool. I, I think I might really like to do this, but I know nothing about it. Um, and then the other, the, the other side of that same curve mm -hmm. is someone who is getting into it now and is, is getting involved in some of these kind of disciplines, but both are aspiring to this professionally. What advice would you, would you give um, to these people? Cool. Um, if you're just starting out, um, well, don't feel you have to make yourself an expert in a bunch of software. Um, the one thing I would say is um, do pick up some digital tool, um, whether it's, I mean, if you want to get into 3D, um, Blender is, uh, it's free and it's pretty powerful. So you can play around with Blender. Um, again, maybe you don't feel like you can afford high-end things. There's a lot of software out there that's basically free um, that you can play with. I would say maybe get used to making your art with the computer, right? Um, get used to kind of working with the technical um, constraints and possibilities of a digital medium. Um, now, I, I would I would assume that if you want to get into this, you've got some passion for making art, making pretty pictures, so channel that through a, a digital means and just kind of get used to that world. Um, and uh, one thing I would say, um, really get control. Over. I, I keep saying that over and over again, it's the idea of control, but um, don't just kind of be happy with, I push some buttons and insanity ensued. Uh, if you, you know, I'm, I'm, I would presume to this hypothetical artist out there who wants to get into this, but doesn't really, feel that they haven't touched CG, doesn't know what it's about. Uh, cool. I, I would presume, though, that you have done a lot of drawing. Like you're, you're there in class drawing in the back of your notebook and, and always doodling and sketching. Um, and you kind of feel a level of control that you, you're starting to make the, the ideas there in your head. You can now be able to get that on paper. Um, try to then gradually transfer some of that into a digital medium. Um, don't maybe be overly ambitious. The things you could draw on the back of your notebook aren't the kind of things you can make right out of the gate um, in CG. So if you download a copy of Blender, don't make that giant demon monster that you drew on the back of your notebook. Start uh, simpler because, again, if you are, uh, you're shooting too far with it, you're not going to have control. And so um, see what you can do to really, even simple things, just kind of sculpt and shape, play with light and color, and see if you can kind of really get a feel for um, even a kind of a small sense, some mastery over, hey, I made something that I felt I you know looked cool and I could control this. Um, and uh, again, don't uh, don't think it has to all be digital. All of your analog skills, your, your your painting, drawing, sculpting, working working in clay, working with whatever. Again, I, I engineered as a child geeky R two D two costumes. And I think that kind of problem solving and construction, all that definitely came into play. So the more, the more stuff you can make, the better. <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, then on the other end, the, the person maybe already has. Um, so your hypothetical person, do they maybe already know a bit of software and where do you then channel that from here? Yeah, I'm, th I'm thinking of, and, and these are these hypothetical people, of course, are based off of real world conversations that I've had. Yeah. Um, you know, here's a person who already is getting into this. And I think once you get into something, suddenly all these possibilities of what you can invest your time in learning mm -hmm. appear on the horizon. Yeah. And um, I think often a smart question could be like, hey, if I'm aiming at a career like this or and and or if I'm aiming at, you know, preparing for that career by coming to Nomen, 
Mm -hmm. um, what would be the wisest investment of my time as I move forward? Cool. Um, well, one thing I would say is uh, be aware there's a lot of other skills that we will introduce you to that maybe you aren't really aware of. Like I mentioned rigging. That's something that's not on the average student's radar. Um, but uh, one thing I would say is be open to other things. Uh, typically, the first thing people get into in, in digital sense is digital modeling, because the first thing you have to do is you have to make something. And so you're there, you know, you're pulling vertices around, you're trying to make an object. And that's cool. That's kind of the first thing that you find kind of a passion for is digital sculpting. Uh, cool. Maybe that's what you want to do. But um, also be aware there's a lot of other stuff out there we're going to expose you to. Um, because uh, you, it's critical to know everything in the pipeline. So as a digital modeler, you know how your product is going to work in the hands of the rigor that goes on to then animate it. So the, the creature you're modeling is actually animatable. Um, and there is more to that than you might think. So part of it is uh, have a mind open for all the different um, uh, things that are out there. Don't kind of get maybe super focused up front. Um, and like I say, uh, push yourself with the software to, um, I, I keep saying this, artistic control, right? Um, one thing which uh, said to the students in the past, if um, you're turning in a reel uh, for, for Nomen uh, to our um, uh, the re recruiting people, um, we might not be as impressed because I've gone through Nomen reels uh, myself as well here. If you make the dragon from Game of Thrones, right? that is ambitious and you're shooting for the moon, but that's way above your ability at this point, at this stage of development, that, that dragon was more than you could do. We would rather not see a overextended dragon than something simple, like, say like okay, a pair of scissors, right? Model a pair of scissors, because there's enough going on there. There are the proportions and the curves and the bevels and the details. There's a lot you can do to finesse the hell out of a pair of scissors that would impress us more because yeah. it's showing you have these observational skills that you really saw this thing, deconstructed it, and, and had that control then in the software. Yeah. Um, again, again, going back to control, um, and as an artist, if you, you're not an artist if you're just kind of pushing buttons willy-nilly, right? Um, so um, not saying everyone, please turn in your standard scissors. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you use that sort of right. now we're going to be modeling scissors. We're going to see exactly, a yeah. So show up Anna in and these guys, the portfolio these, like, bunch, bunch of scissors. Yeah. But um, it's the idea that um, it, it can be kind of a mundane thing, mm -hmm. but uh, we want to see your observation. You know, it's also as an artist, you're showing us your eye, right? And if you're turning in a dragon that looks kind of. Eh, you know, we think, do you think this looks really good? Is this kind of, you know, um, so we're not just kind of judging you, I say judging you, but we're not just kind of seeing your um, technical skills, but also your eye for nuance and detail and control. Absolutely. You're yeah. helping to alleviate something really important too. Um, and I know that this came up in our admission stream, which we did mm -hmm. recently. Um, in fact, that you can go into our video log on, on Twitch and watch that stream with our director of admissions if you're interested in learning more about portfolio and how to prepare mm -hmm. a portfolio for yeah. coming to Nomen. That is an invaluable resource. Go watch that. Mm -hmm. But yeah. one of the things that came up in that was, um, you know, a lot of times we'll see portfolio submissions come in for our programs uh, that have a lot of tutorial work in them, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, ranging from the Blender Donut. <laughs> which is a mm -hmm. classic tutorial yeah. to some really awesome complex stuff. And one of the things uh, that came up um, as an answer to that was you know, well, essentially what you're saying is, you know, we'd rather see something that you made that you're not mm -hmm. copying a process of someone else making it mm -hmm. because we want to see you problem solve that pair of scissors yeah, uh, or, yeah. you know, whatever that simple, that, that simple toy or whatever it is that you're doing. And I think that what you're saying is so important because, um, you know, you'll be far more impressive. This is what I hear you saying, if you don't mm -hmm. mind me paraphrasing. No, no, please. It'll be far more impressive if you can take something simple and show your observational skills mm -hmm. and your ability to execute that well than if you do a really impressive looking model from a tutorial. 
Um, Absolutely. To Absolutely. Shoot the moon, as it were. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah, don't, don't worry about the simplicity of something. If you're doing something simple, really, really well, you know, you're hearing from someone who has a trained eye and you're, you're also a part of, of observing <laughs> uh, some of the portfolios mm -hmm. coming in. So you're getting it from the source guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, before we jump into, you know, really digging into some of these questions coming up in the chats, mm -hmm. um, and I want to ask this because I think it might help to fuel additional questions. Um, what do you feel is unique about Nomen as a place to learn? I mean, you've already touched on the mm -hmm. fact that industry professionals as instructors, mm -hmm. you've touched on some other things, but what, what else would you say is really special about Nomen as a place to come to? Um, there's a lot. I think... Um, pretty much everyone at the school is an artist and, and, and has a, a passion for this. And um, just uh, when you are, are at Noman, you're sort of immersed in the, the sort of world of, of artists and this whole sort of mindset and way of, of, of this is the life you want to live. Um, and also we, we, we respect uh, <laughs> We respect the sort of career path and um, these kind of skills you have. One of the things we tell all of our instructors is uh, teach the class you wish you had back then. Um, that we don't micromanage the curriculum. We understand that um, uh, this is the changing industry. And you know the, the curriculum, what we taught this one class, one year, that's going to be changing in the years to come. So I think Nomen is very quick to adapt to newer trends in the industry and kind of keep up. We know this is a moving target. And um, when I say we're quick to adapt, that doesn't mean that we, this is the new hot trend, quick teach this. That it's not sort of based on the fashion of the moment, but it's uh, the sort of long, long view trend uh, and, and view of the industry. We do adapt. Um, and again, trusting our instructors, we don't micromanage and say, okay, I'm hiring you to teach uh, such and such class. You're going to be doing this in week one, this in week two, and then so on. Um, as long as the classes uh, bridge one off the other, um, I, I don't tell the teachers what they should be teaching. I figure you're the expert. I, I brought you in because you are amazing and I trust you implicitly. You know this better than anybody. So you give our students the best possible experience. And it's my job to make sure that there is communication between instructors. It's like running a, a, a production where I've got amazing artists at the studio and I want to make sure that everybody can kind of work off each other, right? So when you're handing your asset on to the next person, they're able to work with in the communications there. That's my main thing. It's not telling the artist what they should do, but how they are interweaving with the artists around them. So yeah. we have our classes in Houdini and all the teachers are amazing. And as long as they kind of know, okay, I gave them this experience in Houdini 2. When you pick up in Houdini 3, where do we kind of pick up and go from there? Just so they kind of know the foundation they're working off of. Yeah. So it's, it's that kind of uh, Im implicit trust in our faculty because they are the best at what they do. Um, and uh, it's, it's also respecting the students. Um, one thing, you kind of circling back, you uh, saying you can tell – when um, you know this person studied under Michelangelo, you can tell the influence of the instructor. Uh, I really like that. Um, I, I respect that our instructors aren't trying to make clones of themselves, mm. right? Yeah. Uh, for instance, um, uh, it's kind of nice having our classes online because I can kind of log in and lurk on all the classes that I want, <laughs> and I can kind of be like, "What are you doing?" That's um, it. The secret's out. Now our instructors know that you're lurking in the background. Oh, they, they see my name. You know, <laughs> yeah, I, I have to put my name in the log. I don't put like gotcha. Bo yeah. Jansen. Don't worry. Uh, but um, I, I logged into uh, Nick De Silva, who teaches our VFX uh, demo reel classes. So that's the stage when the students are now making these amazing pieces, going their demo reel. And I really appreciate how um, he's not trying to make the students work like something he would do. Like, if I were doing this, I would take it in this direction, right? He still is respecting the students and letting them kind of make something that's, that, that's their own, it's unique, it's special, it has their own personal stamp on it. And his job is to help them kind of make the most of that. And 
yeah. lead them forward without saying, nope, make it blue. <laughs> but I, I really like red. Nope, it should be blue. So it, it's, um, it's helping the students be their best, not, you know, be their own best, not the instructor's best. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it, I can definitely echo that. That's one of the things that I love. And in addition to that, uh, all the instructors that I've had the privilege of learning from at Noman, they're also incredibly generous. Um, like I recently took a uh, creature design class with Kyle Brown, um, who has worked it with Aaron Sims, Sims company has worked on some amazing projects. And, uh, he, you know, our, I would say our instructors do a really good job of giving you all the tools that they use, you know, and he shared with us a process that he and a couple other artists that Aaron Sims kind of invented as a non-destructive process that really helps, you know, when you're approaching, you know, creating something like that, um, that's sort of like, you know, that's, that's a really good kind of under the table knowledge to have. Yeah. And instead of keeping that to himself, <laughs> uh, competitively, yeah. he's like, no, you're my student. So I'm going to give you everything I've got yet in the same stroke. He's not saying, but do it my way. Yeah. You know, make it yeah. look like how I would make it look. And it, yeah, yeah, I think you're hitting the nail on the head, Bo, because yeah. that's, that's really, really awesome. Um, that's I one think, thing I'll, I'll kind of chime in yeah. the idea of ego. Um, something to kind of keep in mind about the industry is this is often like a really cool sort of like prestige kind of things. Like ooh, everybody wants to be, um, you know, I want to make the next big, a, you know, big movie or the next game or whatever. Um, and that's cool. And you kind of tack your ego on there, but you'll find that the artists who are now kind of high end veterans don't have their ego attached onto this, mm -hmm. that, their their pride is in this amazing work they're doing not look at that cool thing that made a lot of money and was number one at the box office yeah um and so those are the kind of people we hire we don't hire people who are trying to come in and impress the students with the cool work they've done and we see this as like i say kind of we're teaching the next generation and we take that very seriously um i mean i I've shown, like, I, I realized one of my little tutorials I, I gave in one of the classes. I was like, wait, you realize if we did this a bit differently, we would kind of do the stuff we did back on Mystique. And so even though that wasn't the intended lesson, it's like, hey, I'm going to show you all the Mystique stuff and show how we could do this with today's tools a bit differently. Oh, and yeah. like you say, I always put that out there because, you know, it's I'm not like sitting here like freaking Gollum with my little ideas I want to. You know, yeah. I, I want to hoard off for myself that there's something really exciting about putting these ideas out for the students. Absolutely. And if, if you don't want to share those ideas, that's in, in my opinion, that's because too much of your ego is attached to it. And I'm, I'm cool because I know this. Um, and if anything, I feel like it's rewarding for me to throw, to put these ideas in our students. It's like throwing gas on a fire. It's like, hey, here's an idea, then whoo, see what they do. And yeah. it's, I, I love being blown away by the work they can accomplish. I find that very fulfilling as an artist to do that. Yeah, a scarcity mentality when it comes to skills and knowledge is about yeah. the opposite, about as opposite as you can get with creativity and art. Yeah, and yeah. I think the more you share, the more possibilities there becomes. I, exactly. Yeah. Um, well, let's let's jump into some of the, the questions that have been coming up yeah. in the chat because we've had quite a few come in. Um, so thanks for being patient, guys. Um, and we're going to do our best to get through as, as many as we've got in the time. I'll talk fast. All right. Lightning round. Are you ready, Bo? <laughs> yes. Go. All right. No, we're going to, we'll give, we'll give some thoughtfulness to these questions. Yes. As well, guys. Um, I'm just kind of scrolling back through the feed. Let me bring that down to my other monitor here. Okay. All right. Uh, just jumping back a little bit. Boom, boom, boom. All right. So um, Jorist is asking, oh, we already dealt with that question. Uh, what software we're teaching at Noman. Mm -hmm. Um what are some good resources for someone wanting to make connections with others in the, in the industry that comes in from Joe Bedwell? Uh, so, uh, come to know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, um, it, it, it is a small world. Uh, like I say, and it, it's amazing how many uh, faculty that I've worked with and, 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 and known and how everyone has kind of the same uh, group of people. Um, Making connections are one of the things that we do have at uh, 
at a Noman when we are meeting in person, we have a lot of um, uh, outreach things, even beyond just being um, in the class and having these people teach you that are connected. Um, we have you know events uh, where you can see the people that are working on whatever projects and games and doing cool stuff. And mm -hmm. they're right there. And other people are coming to the events as well. So you are sitting amongst a crowd of hundreds of people that are in the industry. We have gallery exhibits and shows. So we try to do our, what we can to kind of foster these kinds of connections. Um, and there are other things, uh, of course, I'm mentioning things that aren't happening now because of the lockdown. Uh, <laughs> Well, so, I mean, if I can, yeah. if you don't mind me jumping in there, please, um, please. we we haven't stopped doing that. Um, and, and you, you, you're not yeah. having the in-person quality, but right here on our Twitch channel, if you go back and look through the backlog of our videos, we're doing all of our events um, right here and we're doing them yeah. live. So we've got some really incredible um, interviews with artists, artists presenting their processes. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a 100% free learning resource for anybody yeah. that wants to start, you know, devouring that content because it's all really good. Yeah, that's one of the things also to be sort of unique about Nomen is that um, it isn't just sort of a, a, a resource for throwing information off to students, but it's a networking resource that we're doing everything we can to. Um, I mean, we, we figure like our events, this is a way for artists to showcase their work uh, to an audience that would really respect it and be you know, impressed by it and sharing their knowledge. So it's a whole synergy. I, mean, I, I love helping inviting artists to come in for Nomen events because I know this is a cool way for them to feature their work. Our students are being exposed to this cool new idea. Um, so yeah, again, it's, it's uh, community, community building. Yeah. And a big part of that community too is your fellow students. Oh, um, absolutely. You know, getting to build those relationships and we really encourage a lot of collaboration between students as a part of the educational process here. So when you, when you finish the program, uh, you also have contacts that they're going to be going out and starting to work in the industry too. So as mm -hmm. that whole class starts to come up together, um, yeah. a lot of times, you know, we've got people who are graduates of Nomen at one studio that are going, Oh, here's a graduate from Nomen. I know what their education was. Yep. Um, I, I know what to expect from them. And so that helps to open the door as well, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, th this is a this is a broad question, so I'll let okay. you zero in on whatever aspect you choose okay. to kind of manage it. Um, but Anon uh, Stefan or Steven asks, which software do you think will be the future of CG industry? Um, and uh, you know, and you can also reinterpret that if you want to go broader than just software too. Yeah, um, that's the thing. I've been around long enough to know better than to try to predict trends. I've seen enough people try to do that. And um, yeah, the, the specifics are always changing. Um, I, I remember in the course of one year, the the software I was using, I was using uh, uh, Explore TDI Wavefront and Alias software. And in the course of about a year, all those were gone and Maya came around. Um, so things change. Um, and like I say, I, that to me, I, I probably know better than to predict. I, mean, I can see things that are really amazing. Like I can see stuff that's happening in Unreal, stuff that's happening in Houdini. I can look at a GPU renderers like Redshift and go, wow, this is amazingly fast. This is a real game changer. But um, so I can see trends right now. Uh, like for instance, um, uh, for Lucifer, the rendering in that we switched uh, from V-Ray to Redshift, and I couldn't. We couldn't have produced that show um, if it weren't for Redshift. So there are things that are definite game changers that are coming in, but I'm not going to be so bold as to draw a vector past that and say because it was happening this month, here's the future five years from now. That I think you have to be open to adapt to new things as they, as they come not get rooted in this one piece of software or kind of mm -hmm. um, emotionally invested. It's really easy as an artist to get emotionally invested in a piece of software. Like I, I've worked in Maya since its inception and yeah, I've made a lot of work with it and you feel a little bit of sort of um, the sort of a personal emotional attachment to it, right? Because it's helped me make these things, but I have to realize that I can't become personally attached to it. Because if something else comes along, that's going to be stronger. If, if Blender or Houdini or God knows what, I mean, years from now, if that's a better tool, I want to use that. 
or if, if say, I'll say better because that's kind of black and white. If that tool can better enable me to do what I want to do, I want to adapt to that. Um, and that's why, again, what we teach uh, is principles. We know that um, what we're teaching the students now, I tell this to my classes, that um, I'm, I'm showing you the mechanics of working with uh, fluid simulation and blah, blah, blah. But you're going to look back once you're professionals and veterans, maybe 15 years from now and go, oh, I remember that. That was so quaint. Remember how we had to do it back in the day? Yeah, that was so <laughs> primitive. I know that the semantics of the software, the buttons are pushing in the way that it's processing it. That's going to be very different 15 years from now, but the principles are going to be there. That's going to be transcendent. Um, so for instance, uh, if you look at like, uh, going back to history of the effects, Ray Harryhausen, if you know Ray Harryhausen, uh, he did all the stop motion uh, characters and did Clash of the Titans and Jason and the Argonauts, his old stop motion puppets. If you look at his process, he had modeling, surfacing, rigging, animation, compositing. He had basically all the things we're doing now in a digital sense, he had those same concerns, same principles. Mm -hmm. And so even though how you apply it is completely different, those considerations are transcendent. Yeah. So I would say what's going to be the big thing from now, uh, those artistic skills, the problem solving, that's going to be around, but the mechanics are going to be, we're going to have a plug put in our head and we can just sort of like think it and it goes out. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. Right. But um, how you, the, the problem solving, and the artistic skill, that's still going to be going up your, your uh, cerebral yeah. port. Yep, absolutely. Um, we've got a, another question um, from, let me just go back to it. Let's see. Um, looks like real Wix um, LK or something to that effect. Um, it, the nature of the question is, you know, what what can be done on your own and online? Is, is it possible to be, become a great VFX artist if, you know, all you can do is kind of online and on your own? Um, it, it can be, but it's much more challenging. Um, I, I'll speak to even kind of my own work because I've um, had times where I've kind of gone off and worked on my own personal projects. And it's very hard to challenge yourself in an effective way. Um, when I've worked in my own projects, I've, I've worked in my own things, even when I've been sort of like, you know, a, a veteran and had, you know, years of experience. But once you're kind of working on your own stuff, it's easy to get complacent. And it's easy to kind of use the same bag of tricks over and over again and not push yourself. So there's something um, in a, well, I'm talking about production. I'll, I'll come back to education. When you're in production and you're having uh, other tasks being thrown your way that you have to then adapt to and other artists around you that are sharing ideas or the synergy of, of ideas, that's going to be important. Um, and just being in the midst of that is, is very, that's it, invaluable for helping push you into new directions. So um, that's, you know, taking that framework then back in education, I would say um, it's going to be hard to, to learn in a vacuum. Mm. Uh, can you, uh, I mean, you can learn, but I think the economy of effort is much better when you've got someone to help guide you. Now, that's not saying do it my way, right? Um, but here is the most um, efficient way to get this information and, and master it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I learned most of this on my own because there, there wasn't a gnomon back when I was starting this stuff. And I realized how much I kind of spun my wheels on a lot of things. And it's like, I learned it, but I was, you know, I, I could kind of ask people, but it's kind of this fragmented bits of information. Uh, the thing about Nomen is in just a couple of years, we can very, we have an experience, a, a journey, if you will, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, to take you on that really efficiently introduces you to these key concepts. Now, um, if you're doing it on your own, um, it's harder to focus. It's harder to focus your energy, and it's harder to do that in a vacuum. Um, having others around you 
that are sharing your experience and seeing them tackle problems that you may have and how they got past it to have someone right there to kind of help coach you through difficulties. And, and also as an artist, uh, part of it is also training your eye. Um, and that's even probably harder to do in a vacuum. So you can say, yeah, that composition doesn't look right. Look at the lighting and the colors aren't working and, and such and such. It's hard to train your own eye to do that. And throwing up work on, you know, um, any kind of online platform and saying, hey, give me crits, please. That's also not very um, economic. So the short answer is, yeah, I can. I guess you kind of can, kind of. But it's it's going to be a harder slug and a um, less efficient use of your time. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that being said, um, I think it's important to point out uh, with regards to what Noman teaches online. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we do. We've offered online live classes for quite some time, so we already mm -hmm. had a custom built platform for that. Yeah. And then that platform has served us very well now in quarantine because now um, everything. We've taken everything of our full-time programs online. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that means if you're interested in even taking an individual class at Nomen, mm -hmm. um, all of our individual classes are available on that online platform. Yeah. So speaking of online, you have the option of learning online right now um, for as long as we need to be in quarantine. All of those classes are now available. Um, mm -hmm. And what you'll get is not just the information, um, but you'll get live time with your instructor, yes. professional critique. You'll get interaction with those peers in your class. It is a live classroom experience. So, mm -hmm. and also if you're international, um, you, if you're living outside of the U S you can take an online class mm -hmm. with no mint. So, um, I think it's a big part of it too is, you know, so if you're out there and you, the only option you have right now is kind of on your own self learning and looking at tutorials, uh, that doesn't mean that, oh, well, it's not worth it. I should just stop learning altogether. Um, I think you definitely keep learning, but a big part about learning is learning how to learn. Um, Absolutely. And you don't know what you don't know. So look for whatever opportunities you can reach for from your present mm -hmm. situation and maybe stretch for that um, because that will help you to get to the next thing. Um, yeah. And just the fact that everything's online through Nomen right now really provides um, a massive open door online for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing I want to say about our online classes is these are not YouTube tutorials. This isn't a talking head that's here talking at you for a couple hours, right? Um, we, I highly encourage all the students, you know, you, I, you have a microphone and a camera, please speak up. You know, um, I'm not just talking at my monitor, I'm talking to you. So this should be a, uh, an experience where you're still asking questions. It's like, I'm there in the room with you. I need, I want to know feedback from you of how, how you're doing. Do you have questions? How's this feeling? And uh, we also have the capacity to um, share other students' monitors. So if you say like, hey, my, my scene isn't working, what's wrong with this? Um, I have the capacity to say, cool, can I share your monitor? We can look at it, we can check it out, make sure all of your personal embarrassing emails are off the monitor, just have the software. But I can now look at it, even take over keyboard and mouse and say, hey, if you plug this into that and do the other. So I, I have, other than, um, being able to uh, personally smell you in a classroom, I have pretty much all the interactivity I had before. I well, that would just be you. that would just be creepy if you needed to smell. The smell somebody. of vision, yeah. We, yeah. Uh, no man's element doesn't have the smell of vision, and yet um, we're working on that, though, guys. Okay. Because we want to smell. All right. Um, so uh, I think we kind of dealt with this question um, a bit earlier, but uh, maybe if there's any additional information you want to tack on briefly with regards to the answer. Um, and I just love the name. Tony Stark Skywalker 10 is yes. asking, um, how how important is it to have studied art fundamentals for VFX animation? Um, that's the thing. There is potentially kind of a home for anybody. If you are just a like a, a programmer, you're like, you know, I like the problem solving and the math part of this and all that. Uh, there can be a home for you in doing, uh, for instance, uh, pipeline management, how to organize all the assets. So it's possible to work in a VFX studio and not really be one of the art people. Now that isn't necessarily our focus at Noman. We focus more towards the 
uh, making amazing imagery. Uh, but there is that uh, home for the people who don't, you know, it's like, I don't want to draw, I don't want to sculpt, I just want to really do the, the the cool programming number crunchy kind of thing. There's a home for you there. Um, and again, a whole spectrum of that, right? If you want to be more the person who's doing the, the painting, sculpting, artistic kind of stuff, there is a home there as well. Now, um, I would say there's a vast middle ground. Um, so as much as you can bring to it, it's going to help you. You know, the more uh, artistic side of things you have, that you can exploit that and run with that. If you can also throw in cool, logical, problem solve number crunchy kind of stuff, you can run with that. They, they definitely bolster each other. Mm -hmm. And when you say like the cool artistic side of things, are you talking about um, raw talent and inclination? Or are you also talking about just the willingness to learn about it, um, regardless of your talent yeah. level? It's also training your eye, right? So, um, you know, if, if you're doing, you know, okay, uh, I'm thinking like fire, right? You saw the explosion. Um, if you're making an explosion, you're getting into the mechanics of combustion and how the fire works, but you have to have an eye for, is this fire at the right scale? Am I, am I making a campfire or a house fire? Because those look very different. How fast is the smoke moving and the churn through that? The, the light from the fire going through the smoke, the kind of glow, is that, that right? So having that kind of artistic eye is going to be important. Um, so I would say at least bring that artistic uh, critical vision, even if um, if maybe if I gave you colored pencils and paper and said, draw some fire, if you like felt awkward at that, well, at least kind of have an eye for it. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, we've got a question, uh, let's see, from uh, Jorist. Mm -hmm. And again, you kind of pointed towards the answer to this a little bit, but um, it's good to hit the nail on the head. Would you recommend someone who wants to be a Houdini artist to learn effects in Maya as well? Um, it wouldn't hurt. I would say the more ways you know of accomplishing a task, the more you can can bring to that task. I would say if if an artist says, uh, I'm, I'm a great sculptor, but all I can do is ZBrush. Well, you're more of a technician in the one software. I, I would hope you'd have a little bit more to bear to, to bring to it. Now, as, as an effects artist, maybe the only real tool you know is Houdini. It's kind of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. I've worked with plenty of artists who just work in Houdini. That's fine. But I, I think it's good to have a perspective beyond just that one piece of software. Um, just to kind of see other ways of doing things. It's going to help give you more even more flexible in how you approach your Houdini projects. Um, and frankly, not that Houdini is going anywhere anytime soon, but what happens if something else happens and, and Maya has amazing tools and you don't want to use those because you're only working in Houdini. Um, again, I, I'm always hesitant to get one piece of software because you get, you can get emotionally attached to it and get kind of myopic with it. Um, so, the answer is yes, maybe you only would use Houdini, but the more you know, the more you can bring to it, the better. To give you yeah. breadth of knowledge. Yeah. Um, see, uh, here's an interesting question. Uh, Ricky NG17. Uh, hello, Adam and Bo. Hi, thanks for saying Hi. hello. Uh, between a specialist and generalist, um, what would, in other words, learning more specialized skills and general skills, uh, what would you recommend for someone living in a developing country that has limited uh, has a limited VFX industry. Gotcha. Good question. I would say, um, uh, well, coming out of school at least, because what you're talking about is the, um, the initial job. <laughs> you want to be able to get employed and get experience. You kind of get the groundwork to then see where your career takes you. But um, uh, in, in a broader sense, uh, how employable you are as a generalist as uh, compared to more of a specialist. Um, I've liked, uh, I spent more of my time, I think more as a generalist, I kind of done the whole spectrum of production, um, kind of done a bit of everything in the course of my career. I, and I, that's geared me more towards mid-sized studios as opposed to the larger studios. 
Um, if you're working at like ILM, like my, my buddy Talmadge, um, he's, they're going to hire people that are very specialized. You do that one thing and you are amazing at it. You do simulations or you do rigging or you do modeling and you are, you are just the complete rock star in that one thing. Um, because they don't need you to switch out. They're hiring you to do that one specialty. So bigger studios are typically more specialty oriented and would be less uh, apt to hire a generalist. Uh, generalists are gonna be more for uh, mid-size, uh, especially small studios. If a small studio, um, who knows the kind of tasks they're gonna have from one week to the next. Maybe they have got, you know, we have a, now a new character to have to model. So guess what? Now you're a modeler, <laughs> you have to model for us. But the next week, oh, we have to blow something up. Now you're a simulation artist. So they want that adaptability in their workforce. So um, what I would say is it's contingent on the kind, the size of the studios and the kind of work they're doing. So um, if it's a developing country, uh, I'm going to presume they don't have massive uh, studios that would take more of a, um, a focused specialty field as opposed to a generalist. Um, I'm saying hypothetically, I haven't researched that to know where you live, what kind of work's being done. But um, frankly, I would look up the studios where you want to work and see the kind of work they're doing. If you can do some poking around and find out the number of employees, if their number of employees is well under 100, you know those need to adapt. Uh, look at the kind of work they're doing as well. You know, if they're doing, you know, like they do no real characters, right? then, you know, who knows, maybe you don't emphasize your character skills. Um, or frankly, who knows, maybe if you do come in with really strong character skills, you're now their character guy. <laughs> you gotta help them take new projects. But um, smaller places are gonna want more generalists. So I would gear it off of the size of the studios where, where you're gonna be working potentially. Well, and it sounds like you're saying too, like that having some of a generalist skill set is also helpful in just getting that first job. Too. Oh yes. Often yeah. that's going to be at a medium or smaller size studio. Yes. So that's why even if we have our graduates who are specialized, I just do this kind of one thing. I do this one thing really well and they're geared towards a, a bigger studio to hire them on. Um, they're still going to be able to interface with people elsewhere in the pipeline. Cause um, as, as great as it is to work with artists who know how each other work and have that kind of synergy, Nothing is worse than someone who doesn't know beyond their one little set of tools. So we make sure that we're producing the kind of artists we would want to work with. Um, let's see. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. Uh, just looking into some of the additional questions here. Uh, uh, Canimation asks, um, if you are showing good texturing um, in modeling and, and, and you, you, know, you have a, a texturing reel, um, but you only used uh, substance more. Um, would that lack? Would that you know lessen the chances of being considered when it comes to being hired? Um, because the standard is Mari, and so I think the nature of the question is: if my if my reel is relative to substance, and I'm I'm producing that that work with only one particular software, um, that may not be um, the super standard. Um, is that going to limit chances of getting hired or what advice would you have for that person? Sure. Um, well, substance versus Mari, I've actually seen kind of it, a little more substance than Mari out there these days. Um, but um, yes, it, well, on, on one hand, you're going to be a little more uh, employable if your software set matches what they're using that day. Mm -hmm. that um, you can come right in and sit down and start working. And that's cool. That's going to be a little more appealing. But um, a lot of people, I'll, I'll talk in kind of a broader sense here. Um, for entry level jobs, especially, I don't think that necessarily you're always hired based on your skills and your software and everything that day. Um, you're hired kind of as an investment because they see, all right, you, you really have a good eye for this. I see your, the way your observational skills, your execution and technical skills. This is really, this is really good. I'm going to want to have you around. I'm going to hire you now that I can afford you because uh, years from now, you're going to be really good and too expensive to hire. 
Um, so I think people are often hired as an investment. And if you have a hot shot uh, reel and substance, but that studio where you're applying to only does Mari, I don't think that necessarily cuts you out of the game. Um, it would be helpful if you knew a bit of Mari, but um, if you got the fundamental skills, uh, places might be willing uh, to say, okay, we're going to give you, you know, a, a week to kind of sit down and we're not going to give you a task right away. We're going to throw you in front of Mari or whatever else we use. And you just fill your brain as fast as we can ask questions, do whatever, but get up to speed because we're going to, you're going to start using the software. So that, that's not unheard of. Now, of course, knowing it makes you more hireable. What I might suggest if you get your hands on a copy of Mari or again, and anything else, if you're using Blender, but no places are hiring Blender artists and you want to go to a Maya house, if you can get your hands on a, a, you know, a learning copy or a trial version of Maya and aggressively learn and do something in Maya that looks clean and polished, Again, not overly ambitious, but you've got something to show, hey, I do know a bit of this. I got my foot in the door. I'm not a complete noob with this. That's going to help. That's going to go a long way, I would say. Cool. Um, let's see. Steja or Steja um, 070 is, is asking, um, I'm learning Houdini on my own through online courses from Applied Houdini, Rebelway, and uh, CG Recruit, etc. Uh, could you throw some light on what would be expected from a beginner effects artist showreel? Um, and additionally, would a uh, college full-time course be more help um, than, than what they're currently doing? Uh, well, like I was saying, one of the benefits of doing uh, our classes at Nomad is the economy of effort that um, when you're trying to kind of drive your own education, that can be a little tricky. Like, because like what you said, you don't you don't know what you don't know, and um, getting the idea of sort of best practices and um, one of the things that like in our level Houdini classes, a lot of it is student driven projects, and the teachers are kind of there to help guide you through technical problems and technical issues and make kind of the best pipeline for producing that. That would be kind of hard to do on your own. So, um, yes, going through a class is going to be more economical of, of your time. Uh, but okay, uh, going to, uh, we want it on a show reel. Well, um, I would say there's a lot of fundamentals that you want to show. Can you use particles and RBDs and fluids? Uh, do you know flip? Um, all those kinds of basic things. We throw in the Houdini, some procedural modeling and proceduralism, you know, kind of thing. So, uh, that would show kind of the meat and potatoes, uh, things because probably the work you'd be getting as an entry level Houdini artist you'd be doing dust hits and you'd be doing sparks and things maybe aren't quite as sexy, but they're kind of feeling you out to make sure that you've got your production shops. So show the fundamentals. Um, one thing I also encourage a lot is plate integration. Unless you're gonna be doing um, like full CG kind of things, uh, knowing how to work in the context of a plate is gonna be important. So can you work with actual footage and integrate your work into that? Um, and one thing I would also say in terms of a real it needs to have something of you on it. It needs to show your creativity because you're trying to show, okay, I know particles and flip and I know fluids and pyro. I know all these things, but okay, who are you as an artist, right? Because they're not, they're not hiring a button pusher. They're hiring you as a creative individual. Um, now, maybe you're not the one entry level job art directing, <laughs> But do you have this that extra little something something as an artist to bring to bear? Um, that's going to be important. And also, just from a, a marketing standpoint, for them to remember you is going to be important. Something mm -hmm. that kind of stands out. Cookie cutter reels get really boring, very boring. So one of the things we try to emphasize with our student reels is make sure something in there is different. Don't just do class assignments and tutorial kind of things. They're all look very cookie cutter. Put something of your own in there. Um, that's going to show who you are. That's going to make you memorable. So it's like, oh yeah, you're the guy who did the such and such. Oh, that was really cool because that that they remembered that cool thing you made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so let's see. Uh, uh, this is an interesting question from uh, Forever Saint. Hey, uh, to become a CG supervisor, 
is it necessary to know all the aspects of VFX in detail? You should know enough to be able to talk to all the artists. Um, and technically, you should know enough that if you had to sit down and open up the files of any of your artists, you could open that up and, and work with them. Um, now, that doesn't mean that uh, I could go in and I would be the, the best person for that job. Um, you know, maybe I've got someone who's an amazing texture painter and, you know, they're just beautiful with their work. Cool. Trust them. But I should have an idea of what it is they're working in and be able to kind of talk their language because part of working as a CG soup is helping manage the pipeline. So everything kind of goes smoothly and making some decisions up front for how are we going to make this in the first place? So you should have a knowledge of all the tools that you can bring to bear. Um, if you don't, if you say, hey, we're going to use this thing because I think that's going to work. Uh, but the RS who use that going, mm, really? This is kind of putting a round pig in a square hole. I don't think we can do this. Then then you're going to stop. Yeah. So if you're not the expert uh, who's like the best in the studio at it, it isn't, you can be the best in the studio, but you should be able to definitely uh, be able to problem solve with all aspects of the pipeline. Yeah. Now, I thought that was an interesting question for you because I know that you've worked on both sides <laughs> of that of that fence, as it were. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, someone's asking about compositing. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you provide any tips for a career in compositing and how to improve one skill in that area? Um, the thing about compositing is that's something that's also very nuanced. Uh, compositors are the ones who are getting into the final polishing of a shot. And uh, what you get from CG maybe took the look like maybe 80, 90% of the way there. But it's the compositor that does it the last 10, 20%. And even though there may be, there's a shorter journey they're taking to make it look final, it's a, it's a hard slog to get there, to really make it look good. Because when you see a shot, you may say, it's okay, but it doesn't quite look right. It just looks a little bit fakey. That's down to these very small things that the compositor is doing. So I would say almost more so than some of your CG skills, there's a lot of eyeball training to compositing. So you've got your, you know, your basic meat and potato skills. Can you cut a good green screen? Can you do tracking and do you know new how to do your layers? Can you pull apart? an EXR, the AOVs have a multi-channel EXR and do a back to beauty build on that. There's a lot of those kinds of standard things you'd be expected to do as a nuke artist. Um, so uh, again, it's more of the, the laundry list of those kinds of things. Um, but uh, then comes the, okay, how do you really begin to plan out a complex comp in the most efficient way? Because you don't want your comp just turning into a giant bunch of nose looks like a bowl of ramen you know you want to be able to keep that economic and still viable production approach um uh, so again it's problem solving within the software context but beyond that uh the, the big challenge is, is the eyeball training because that's those are those small micro changes that make such a huge difference and um that's going to be harder to do on your own um, it's it, frankly, it's even hard for a comp artist. Sometimes, I, when I was a comp artist, I found that I've, I've done a, a bit of comp, and I found it so hard to see my work as being done. Uh, it was hard for me to make my work look totally photo real and finished because I always kind of saw it as being fake. And so, um, it, it's something where you often do need outside eyeballs to look on it fresh to give you a new perspective. So. Um, yeah, you, you definitely need others around you and they're, they're critical eye to help you through that. Yeah. Uh, we're going to use the remainder of our time to address uh, one or two more questions. But before we do that, I just want to remind our viewers that um, if you have any Nomen related questions, uh, we do have uh, Xander, who is one of our admissions advisors in the chat. Um, uh, and or Hi, Xander. Hey, if you just want to get in touch with Nomen Admissions, uh, he can also provide you a link where you can provide some info and an admissions advisor will reach out to you. Um, the reason why I'm bringing that up is I know that there are a lot of questions out there regarding portfolios and a lot of people looking for help with their portfolios. If you're interested in Nomen as an educational option for you, 
um, you can reach out to one of our admissions advisors. And the way that our advisors work is they are not just the gatekeeper that tells you whether you're good enough or not to get in. They will actually take uh, time with you on the front end before you ever apply uh, to coach you in your portfolio. They'll give you free coaching. They'll point you towards resources that are online that you can use to level up your portfolio. So this is a great opportunity for anyone out there to get professional critique on their work, especially any of you who might feel that you don't have access to that right now. Mm -hmm. I definitely encourage you to reach out to an admissions advisor um, here at Noman. Um, yes, one, th right. that's one yeah. thing real quick. That's mm -hmm. another thing I'm really unique about Noman. Noman is not a diploma mill. It's not just, hey, you got a pulse and a student loan, come on to Noman. Right. Um, we want to make sure the students we admit are here to succeed. And part of the job of the admissions people, they're, they're, it's a great department. They are there more as like coaches to help you through um, and to make sure that you're ready for this, you're prepared and uh, take advantage of those, those people. They're, they're amazing what they do. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you know, just to say, we're very well said, Bo. Um, the mission of Nelman is to uh, make artists ready for the industry. Mm -hmm. We are not looking to just put warm bodies into a curriculum just to teach them yes. skills and then send you off on your own. Um, so that is why we are so intentional with people, with coaching their portfolio before they ever apply, because we want to make sure that this is the right fit for you, mm -hmm. um, because that benefits you and it also benefits benefits Noman's mission. So, um, yeah, that's what we're all about. I mean, last year we had a placement rate of 97% of graduates from a full-time program going into working in studio within six months of graduation. Um, the year before that, 2018, we were at 100%. Um, and those, if you're not familiar with placement rates, those are very, very high rates. And that's because our placement team works directly with the studios. And um, we're also coaching you on your demo reel and the soft skills that you're gonna need to go through interviews and that entire process. So again, um, step number one, if you're interested in them, is just simply reach out. Um, yeah, so I think we've got time for one last question. And um, unfortunately, we weren't able to get through all of them, guys. So I apologize for that. But I'm just going to grab one um, really quick uh, from the chat here. Um, just scanning really quick. Bo, bear with me. There's a lot of great questions in here. Um, so I think I'm going to take a question that came in uh, regarding job security. Uh, as mm -hmm. we're just talking about placement, things like that, because part of the nature of the industry sometimes is going from project to project. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can, you know, work long term within a studio as well. Um, mm -hmm. Being someone who's very experienced, what would you have to say about the security of, um, of the job of a VFX artist when it comes to both of those areas going from project to project, or maybe just trying to secure a long term position at a studio? Uh, yeah, the industry does have its own kind of um, uh, sort of turbulence that can um, swing jobs uh, and, and kind of work from one place to another, different cities, different kinds of jobs. Uh, right now with uh, COVID, there's been some instability in some of the jobs in the industry. But um, uh, in terms of long-term, I mean, can you make a career doing this? And uh, obviously, yes. Um, some people find they might have to move um, like more work is going to Vancouver or to London. So um, some nice artists move, which can be kind of cool because you get to live in places in the world and experience different, you know, different cities. Um, it is a very small world though. Um, you'd be surprised how uh, once you know, you've worked at a couple studios, you kind of exponentially know other people are around. So it's easier to network. Uh, that definitely helps. So networking is a big thing. Um, and also just, it's not kind of goes without saying, doing a good job, you know, being a good person, understanding those around you, uh, managing stress well, um, good communication, all those things are gonna help and, and follow you. Um, you know, I, I've gotten offered jobs from, I didn't even know that this place existed, but they offered me a job because I worked for the person who liked me or I worked other, somewhere else. Um, so it's kind of planting good karma for yourself as you work, doing good work, taking pride in your work and being a, a good a, a good colleague. Um, that's good for job security. Um, but yeah, it, it, it can be a little turbulent. It's actually uh, much better than it used to be. Now, COVID's a little bit different, but I think in terms of security in the industry, it's better than it used to be um, a while back. 
just because the sheer amount of CG being produced. Now, uh, television, um, so much television is being created. I switched more to TV later in my career here. Um, you know, HBO and AMC and Netflix and Amazon, a lot of high end uh, CG being produced. So that's really making a lot bigger job market. And there's more jobs, more job security. Definitely. And I think one of the things that's that's been a learning point for me uh, in the time that I've, I've been working with Noman with regards to education is, you know, I think anytime you watch the credits for, for a film, um, you know, you'll you'll see certain art jobs that might just have a very short list of names. But as soon as you get to the digital production artists or the effects yeah. artists, that's when you kind of get this mile long you know, yeah. paragraph of yeah. different names. So I think when it comes, it, it, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe that when it comes to VFX, you're in regards to job security, you're talking about a, an area of the entertainment industry for artists where there are a lot of job openings, a, a lot yes. more than other other positions necessarily. Definitely. I mean, yeah, just look at the, I know people who work on set and, and do different aspects, you know, on set work and, you know, there's only so many of those, mm -hmm. um, but there's a, and also the thing about it is it is still kind of a young medium. And so there are other things happening all the time. There's other ways of using this, um, we're doing, you know, just to kind of show you other things out there and other things you can do with the skill set. because like, cool, I, I graduated. Now I'm going to go work on movies or work on television. There's so much else to be out there. Uh, we're setting up an event. Uh, here with Miranda, our uh, lovely events coordinator, um, who is um, uh, a, a former student of mine who's now working on uh, ride films and doing location-based uh, attractions. And um, so there's rides you can do, which weren't really as much of a thing uh, a while back. And, um, you know, with real-time things and mobile stuff, there's just so much else out there that um, it's a what you can do with this set is also burgeoning beyond just the, the typical expected jobs are burgeoning. Other things are happening as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I, that, that, I think that's a great note uh, to finish up on. Um, and I want to say both, thank you so much uh, for giving your time today. Um, I know you're staying plenty busy <laughs> as well <laughs> with uh, all of your well, responsibilities I'll and knowing what you've been talking about. So thanks for taking mm -hmm. the time out to talk with us today. I think this has been very invaluable. Um, for the people who have been on the stream. And awesome. if you came into the stream later and you didn't catch the whole thing, uh, please know that you know you will be able to watch this um, in the video log, in the backlog on our Twitch channel, and I believe as well um, on our YouTube channel. So you have an opportunity to go back to watch this stream and any other streams that we've done uh, that you may have missed. Um, just to touch on what's coming up next, uh, next week on this channel, we are having our regular weekly art jam with Josh Herman. Uh, he is our chief creative officer here at Noman. He is also a veteran artist in the industry who's worked with Marvel Studios. He's worked with Cloud Imperium Games, uh, Legacy Effects. And uh, those Wednesdays are from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And it's essentially a three-hour uh, art hang. Uh, uh, art jam to be with Josh to observe him and his process and him talking about how he goes about doing things. He's been working lately in ZBrush, um, actually working on some of the some of his uh, six fan art uh, characters that he's been doing. Um, so that's a great stream uh, to even tune into while you're working on your art. Then you have a, a fellow person who's there adding energy to you as you're watching them in their process. And then um, also next week, we have one of our live info sessions coming up with a guest artist uh, by the name of Leticia Gillette. And she is a very, very accomplished 3D artist. Um, she's worked on some really incredible projects. Um, so definitely follow us on social media and um, continue to follow us here on our Twitch channel to learn more about that event upcoming. But that is going to be on uh, Saturday, July 18th from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific uh, Standard Time. Uh, so that's going to be essentially first half of the time we'll be talking with Leticia and hearing from her, looking at her work, hearing her story. And then we'll be following that up with an informational session, just briefly sharing with you about Noman's educational offerings um, and what we are doing to make artists ready to go out and work in the industry 
um, upon graduation. So with that, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we're so glad uh, that you keep coming back uh, to watch the streams that we're doing. Please spread the word. We want this to be a free resource to you, not only to learn about Nomen, but to get face to face with professional artists that are working on the kind of projects and in the positions that you might be aspiring to. So it's an invaluable time to hear directly um, from artists out there currently working in the industry. So thanks again. We hope to see you next week on Wednesday and on Saturday. So thanks for being here.